Our message this morning is entitled, Our Witness and Testimony. If you listen to the radio program this morning, the message was entitled, Our Witness, and were some thoughts that I had early in the week as I produced the radio program to share. And as the week progressed, more and more thoughts along those lines continued to resonate in my mind. However, today, if you did listen, is going to be a completely different line of thought than what we shared on the radio. But if you would like to know more and like to hear more along these lines, you can tune in uh, via our church website and listen to that radio broadcast. This past week, a very famous public figure in college sports was outed as a habitual perpetrator of a very illegal and secretive sin. And you probably, most of you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, it doesn't matter. That's not what we're going to talk about today. But when things like that happen, certain reactions occur in the population in general. You might also remember last year, we had a certain political figure in our state, the state of Alabama, the governor, who was found to be in a similar shady relationship and sinful relationship, an unethical relationship, and was forced to resign from office. He was removed from office. It's often joked that in Alabama, our governors do three terms, two in office and one in jail. Both of these men, this particular football coach and our governor, among many other men and many other women in the world, were very public in their profession of faith in Christ. They were very adamant about their Christian faith, even to the extent you could argue of using it as a marketing or campaigning tool, a motivational tool for a team, a coaching tool. Today we're not going to beat up on these men, but I want to use that as the backdrop for some of the things that I want to talk to you about. We're certainly no better than those men. But at the same time, we should fear lest any of us be caught up in similar things. As we consider our witness and testimony, which is a subject that we'll talk about in a greater light later in the message, we need to understand first and foremost that if we're harboring secret sin, that sin will eventually be brought to light. If it isn't confessed and repented of, even if you struggle with it, as you confess it to God, you literally find the strength to overcome that, and it's dealt with between you and God. Many times as we hide from God in our sins, that's when God brings the sin to light to deal with it. I was thinking of Proverbs chapter 28 and verse 13 this week as I was watching the news. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. Whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. As we sin in private, secret sin, when we confess that sin to God after the sin is committed, we find mercy and grace, healing. We find strength to overcome that. But if a person enjoys that sin and clings to that sin indulges in that sin, thinks that he is so smart and strategic and clever that he can hide that sin from everyone, including God, God will undoubtedly bring that sin to light. How many times has that happened, perhaps not in your personal life as far as individually sinning, but how many times have you seen that happen in your circle of your network around you? Where there's a secret sin that's harbored sometimes months, sometimes for years. And then God brings it to light. And what a calamity it usually is. The longer the sin goes on, the worse it is when the house of cards crumbles. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. Whoso confesseth and forsaketh them 
shall have mercy. Much of what we'll say in just a moment is going to be about confessing our sins, our witness, our testimony, that which we proclaim. If you had parents and grandparents like mine, there was probably a statement that they shared with you often when you were young. You may be thinking about it now. Your sin will find you out. How many of you recognize that as something that you were taught as a child? Now, Brother Hewlin's shaking his head. That is familiar to him and several others of you in here are doing likewise. That actually comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 32. There are many things that we say in American Christendom that have no bearing in Scripture. Mythical little statements. Cleanliness is next to godliness. And that's in the book of 3rd Jude. You know, it begins, hey Jude, don't be so sad. Anyway, there's not a third Jude. There's a lot of things that we say in Christianity that are not biblical. God will never put on you more than you can handle. That's not in the Bible. It's nowhere found in Scripture. There are many things that we say that are not biblical. But this statement, your sin will find you out, actually comes from Numbers 32 and verse 23. I'll read the verse and then give you the context. If you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure your sin will find you out. Now, the context of this is as follows. Two tribes of Israel, Reuben and Gad. Reuben and Gad. Gad is the root for Gadarene, as in wild Gadarene in Luke chapter 8, one of the examples we used on the radio program today. Reuben and Gad didn't want to go over into the other side of the River Jordan with the remaining tribes, with the other tribes of Israel. And so they asked Moses, if it's, if it's okay with you, look, we'll fight the battles with you. We'll run the inhabitants out with you. We'll do everything we can to help you conquer that land. But we want to come back here where we are on this side of Jordan, and we want to live here. And if you look at a map... Of the 12 tribes, you'll see that that River Jordan separates them. They're to the east of it. Everyone else is to the west of it. It separated Reuben and Gad, these tribes, from the remaining tribes of Israel. So there's a degree of solitude there between these two tribes and the rest of the tribes of Israel. Moses said that's fine. But he gives them this warning. If you do this thing, you will go armed before the Lord to war. We'll go armed... Over Jordan before the Lord till he's driven his enemies out and the land is subdued. You shall return and be guiltless before the Lord. But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord. Be sure your sin will find you out. Build your cities for your little ones. Folds for your sheep. Do that which has proceeded from your mouth. In other words, go ahead with your plan, but don't think that being separated from the rest of the nation is going to remove the accountability that you have to God. Don't feel safe in your solitude just because you think you're alone. Don't for a second believe that God doesn't see what you're doing. Now, specifically, keep the promise that you've just fulfilled. Don't think that since we're establishing your land here that it's okay for you to just... Forget about the remaining battles that have to happen. God knows, and if you hide here while we're all there, God knows that too. But the lesson is, don't think solitude is a shield to sin. Your sin will find you out. Be sure. Be sure your sin will find you out. The more obstinate a man is in his sin... Generally, the more embarrassing it will be when his sin finds him out. How embarrassing do you think it was to certain political figures that we've endured over the last two decades in America when the great sins come to light? What a scandal that is. Do you understand the word scandal had its origin? If you do a word study of that, the word actually began with someone who was discredited religiously. Even the word scandal has reference to one who proclaimed one thing and lived a lifestyle contrary to what he proclaimed. With men that we've seen recently in the news, their sin found them out. 
It's happened time and time again. It will always happen because there's one thing you can count on greater than me, greater than the church, greater than the government, greater than the CIA, greater than the NSA, greater than the FBI. There is a God in heaven, and he doesn't have to try to intercept your emails. He doesn't have to try to tap your phone lines. He knows even the thoughts and intents of your heart before you think them. And so, so much greater than that, he knows your actions, even the things that only he sees, he sees. If you think you are all alone, there is one there that you ought to fear above any other man. And that is the Lord of glory. He sees every single thing that takes place. And he will bring secret sins to light if they are hidden and they're not confessed. Young ones, you can hide things from your parents. My mom and dad will never find out about this. When I was in fourth grade, I had this terrible phobia. If I said a bad word, that my mother was going to come out from behind one of the local trees. And, and we'd be walking around the field and kids would be saying words that they shouldn't be saying at P.E., and I was afraid to say bad words because I thought mom was hiding in the bushes. So whatever that little woman did was effective. If you think your mom's hiding in the bushes watching what you're doing, that's an effective mama right there. And we were a little afraid of that, you know, all of five foot tall woman that is my mother. And by the way, my dad is six foot tall and 245 pounds. And he's built like a professional wrestler. And he's afraid of that little woman. We're not really sure what she'll do, but we know it's terrible. I was afraid that if I said something that I shouldn't say, that she was going to appear out of nowhere and deal with me. I think about how we should feel understanding that we are in the sight of God at all times and how that ought to mold and shape the type of person that we are. Solitude is not a shield to sin. And so what Moses tells Reuben and Gad, the tribes of Reuben and Gad, if you will not do so, if you don't fulfill your obligation, if you hide here individually, some of you men, if you hide here, afterwards, if you hide here, your sin will find you out. There will be a recompense for what you've done. We understand as God's children that God is our Father. He chastens everyone that He loves, according to the book of Hebrews, according to the book of Proverbs. God will chasten every son. None of us are outside the realm of God's chastening. When God brings our sin to light, is that because He hates us? No, it's because He expects better out of us. It's because He loves us. Sometimes, if we refuse to repent in private, God will expose the sin in such a public way that will make us wish we had repented. And the next time we're tempted to harbor a secret sin, we'll remember the very public way that we were embarrassed and humiliated for our sin. And it will effectively teach us, cause us to not want to harbor the secret sin again. It's just the way things work. God is a good father. He's a good parent. Of course, the message today is entitled Witness and Testimony, and the backdrop is the scandals that we see that men harbor secret sin while proclaiming to be very religious. And when this happens, when this happens, it is a great scandal, and as we'll talk about in just a moment, it does give the enemy opportunity to speak ill not only of you individually but even the cause of Christ in general. One of the reasons that our forefathers were so adamant in their teaching of standing for proclaiming of church discipline is one for the good of the church body itself not because we have to keep the church pure and anyone who uses that language needs to understand that it is not the behavior of the disciple that keeps the church pure. It's the blood of Christ. Our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. It is for our own good, however, in that it keeps us accountable. But another reason that people practice church discipline today and in the old days of the faith is because it is a shame to bring reproach upon Christ. When an individual publicly boasts of his religion and then it's found that in private he is a different person than he is publicly, what that does is it brings reproach upon the cause of Christ. The first thing that we want to share with you today concerning being a witness is found in the book of Acts chapter 1. And we're simply setting the stage that this is what you are. You are a witness. 
You are a witness of Christ. When Jesus commissioned his disciples and sends them out, he tells them that they will be witnesses. Verse 8 of Acts chapter 1, You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. Jesus tells them that you, 11 men, and it would soon be 12 as Matthias was added, and then the Apostle Paul would be brought in, and then these other elders and bishops, evangelists, would be raised up to minister and to go out and spread the gospel throughout the entire continent. And as they went, they were witnesses unto Christ. Now, there's a way that they were witnesses that you and I are not witnesses. I made the point on the radio program today that you and I were not there literally in the flesh to see Christ. We're not eyewitnesses. These apostles were called such because they were eyewitnesses of Christ. They literally saw Christ. Now, we are those that Jesus, speaking to his apostles, said that, you're blessed because you believe, but there are men that will... Or you're blessed because you see and believe, but there are men who will believe that shall not have seen, and they are even more blessed than you. You believe not having seen with your natural eye, but having seen through the eye of faith. And so we're not the eyewitnesses that the apostles were, but friends, I want you to understand, if the Spirit of God lives in you, you are a witness of the power of God. Now, let's give you the definition of this word witness. Jesus tells his apostles that they shall be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, under the uttermost part of the earth. And here nearly two millennia later, we stand in the uttermost part of the earth as witnesses to the power of Christ in our lives. A witness is defined by the Oxford English Dictionary as something that furnishes evidence or proof of the thing or fact mentioned. Something that furnishes evidence or proof. Now, even though we're not eyewitnesses of the crucifixion and the resurrection like Peter and James and John were, we haven't seen Jesus the way Paul saw Jesus on the road to Damascus. Literally, he saw Jesus. And there was a time in the wilderness that he spent communing with Jesus. Paul was an eyewitness born out of due time, as he said to the Corinthians. We're not eyewitnesses, but friends, you are a witness. You furnish evidence or proof of the thing or fact mentioned. Every single one of you is proof of the existence of the Holy Spirit. How am I evidence or proof of the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit is in you. How different are you now than before you knew Christ? If you know Christ, there is a difference, especially if you've heard the gospel. Which brings me to another thing that you can bear witness of. You are a witness of the transforming power of the gospel when the gospel comes not in word only, but in power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. You are a witness. You furnish proof or evidence concerning the validity of the gospel because it has changed your life. What does God call you to be? Well, God calls me to be successful. You know, God doesn't call you to be successful. God calls you to be a faithful witness. Being a witness can exist in a couple of different ways. And first of all, your reputation is your witness. The way people see you, the way people know you, when they see you, when they think of you, do they think, that is a believer? Or do they think, man, that's a wild child? <laughs> there was a day in my life that if you said, what do you think of that Ben Winslet guy? He's pretty mean. I mean, his language, not so good. He's liable to hit you right in the head. That was my witness. That was my reputation. What's your reputation? That's your witness. But at the same time, your witness, your testimony is something that you profess. You bear witness to the power of God. You speak about the fact, as we'll talk about later, that Christ is real. That He lives in you. That He saved you from death and trespasses and in sins. 
that he has transformed your life. And though you're not perfect, thank God you're not what you used to be. You bear witness to Christ audibly. You testify. Now, these are legal terms. When you have a court case, what is it that men will do? If a man's being tried for murder and there's an eyewitness that saw him commit that crime, that eyewitness will come into court. He will swear on the Word of God to tell the truth, so help him God, and he will stand there and answer the questions of the attorneys that question him. And the prosecution will ask him question, ask him question after question after question, and he will bear witness to that which he has seen. What happens when a person tells a lie? They bear false witness. They bear false witness. This word witness also is defined by the OED as one who testifies for Christ or the Christian faith, especially by death, a martyr. In fact, in the book of Acts chapter 1, when Jesus tells them, You shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth, the witness, the word there for witness actually comes into our language as the word martyr. What a martyr is today is one who goes to their life willing or goes to their death willingly, gives their life willingly for a cause. A martyr. One who dies for the faith. What sort of a witness was Peter? Peter bore witness of the work of Christ in his life even unto the death. James, the first of the apostles, martyred. He was a witness unto the power of God until the moment that Herod took his head. All of these apostles except for John went to their death testifying of Christ. We're called to be witnesses even if it takes being a martyr for the cause of Christ. The Holman Bible Dictionary defines this word witness as something or someone that bears testimony to things seen, heard, transacted, or experienced. It's amazing to think that you are the evidence furnished because you're the witness. You are evidence of God, and at the same time you bear testimony audibly to those things seen, heard, or experienced. I love the fact that in the Old School Baptist we have... An experiential religion. How many of you have heard that word experiential before? I use it a lot in my sermons. What that means is that it pertains to the experience. It's real. It isn't just hypothetical. It isn't theoretical. It isn't theory or philosophy, but it's, it's something you experience. Your witness is something that you've experienced, that you bear testimony of. We have been with Jesus. We have been with Christ. Now, as we begin to transition into the main thought for today, our witness and our testimony isn't one of self-righteousness or a boastful religion. I was reminded of the words of John Leland a primitive Baptist. How many of you have heard of John Leland? John Leland was an elder, Elder John Leland. He was one of our ministers who lived in the early United States, the early days of our country. He was a very influential minister politically. It was John Leland who met with James Madison and influenced him concerning the religious liberty that was to be added to the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. Congress shall make no law concerning the establishment of religion. Where do you think he got that? He got that from a Baptist preacher named John Leland. John Leland was a man that believed in the liberty of the conscience. He went as far as to say that if government can answer to God for men concerning matters of conscience, then let government dictate how men ought to worship. But if men are to answer individually to God personally for their religion then let government get out of the way. We have much of the freedom that we have religiously today to practice the way that we are practicing because of one of our forefathers, John Leland. John Leland wrote about, or spoke about, in 1802, 
men who made a boastful show of religion. And I want to leave these words on your ear. And I believe that if you read Matthew 23 on your own time, Matthew 23, a condemnation of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll see that much of what Leland is warning against is actually condemned by Christ in Matthew 23. So homework assignment, write that down, go home and read it. Leland said in 1802, guard against those men who make a great noise about religion in choosing representatives. It is electioneering intrigue. If pure religion is a criterion to denominate candidates, those who make a noise about it must be rejected for their wrangle about it proves that they are void of it. In other words, Leland's observation is those who make the loudest boast about their religion when seeking a political office or appointment or any other advancement in life are usually those who know the least about it. What's his point? People who generally go about boasting their holiness in religion are usually people who have less of it in a legitimate sense. And so he said, if you want to consider political candidates, those that go around boasting it are the ones that you probably need to avoid. Let honesty, talents, and quick dispatch characterize the men of your choice, Leland said. I love that quote. I love that quote. When you have an election, and this isn't a political speech because I don't believe politics belongs in the pulpit, but that's a word to the wise. That's a word to the wise. Beware men who boast a self-righteous religion. Beware. As he points out, those who make a noise about it must be rejected. Their wrangle proves they are void of it. One who uh, genuinely understands the gospel of Christ, his testimony is going to be different as we'll share in just a moment. Does that mean we're not to speak of religion or speak openly? No. What am I talking about today? Witness and testimony, but not that witness and testimony. There should never be a holier-than-thou attitude. There's a reason that sinners always felt comfortable around Christ. You ever thought about it? Now, the Pharisees were extraordinarily uncomfortable around Jesus. Jesus would go into their home sit down to eat. Here comes a woman of the city. This is a sinful woman. It's a woman that you probably would not want to be standing there talking to on a street corner. You know, she comes up and starts talking and you start taking a few steps away. I I don't want to be seen talking to this lady. Especially if people are looking, you know, we might get the wrong idea. This woman comes into a Pharisee's house. Jesus is eating. She begins to wash it his feet with her tears and dry them with the hair of her head. This Pharisee is so uncomfortable. If this man were a prophet, he would know what type of a woman this is, what manner of sinner this woman is that touches him. He he would not let her so much as touch his feet. And yet Jesus' words were, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. The Pharisee was confused. Why? Because his was an outward show of holier-than-thou-art religion. We are to confess. We are to bear witness. We are to have a testimony, and I might say publicly, very publicly, that you and I are sinners... Saved by God's grace. What is your witness? Is your witness that you found a great religion? And I agree with you there. Because this is a wonderful worship that we have. We can worship God in spirit and truth. And what a better gospel can you find? There's not one. This is the true gospel of Christ. Grace, unmerited favor. But our boasting, if there is boasting, is to be in the Lord. Our witness is that we were lost and corrupt. And the only reason we can stand before a holy God is that Jesus has saved us from our sins. I'll give you a statement. Our public face, our public face is to be one of confession of sin. Our public face is to be one of confession of sin. It's amazing 
as you look at the lives of men who publicly boast a religion, the public face and the private face are so different. Do you remember when there was a web server hacked a year ago and thousands upon thousands upon thousands of men were exposed as being adulterers? Their sin was brought to light. Their sin found them out. Many of those men were pastors, politicians, leaders, very public people who made a show of religion. Understand that religion has been one of the greatest tools of personal advance, advancement in the history of the world. I've heard it said many times that there, there are so many more atheists than unbelievers in our legislature than you could imagine that claim religion just because it's what it takes to be elected. Our public face is to be one of confession. You know, there's a virtue of confession. There's a value in confession. I'm going to share with you three different ways. Number one, we are to confess our sins to God. Let's get real with it. The book of 1 John chapter 1, if we say that we have no sin, well, we're right. No. Now, legally in the sight of God, do you still have sin? No, Jesus has taken that sin away on the cross. Legally, in God's courtroom, God sees you as if you had lived the very life of Christ. But practically, here in the world, guess what you still are? You're still a sinner. I'm still a sinner. If we say we have no sin, the word sin there is singular. Notice it's not plural. He's not saying if we say we don't sin or have no sins, but if we say we have no sin. In other words, if I say that I no longer possess the nature of sin... I deceive myself, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If I say, I don't have a problem with sin, I'm a liar. Guess what? I'm not going to say that because I'm not a liar. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to look you square in the eye, and I'm going to say, I struggle with sin. And I know that every single one of you does too. Some of you may struggle with anger. Some of you may struggle with lust. Some of you may struggle with control. Some of you may struggle with envy and jealousy. Some of you may struggle with a lack of faith, unbelief. We all have our individual sins that we have to mortify and confess and deal with. But one thing I do know, I do know that every single one of us is a sinner that struggles. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. I'm tricking myself. And the truth is not in us. However, verse 9, if we confess our sins to whom? To God. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There are times in your life when that sin is private, when there is still adequate time to confess that to God and deal with it. It's between you. It's between God. No one else ever has to know. You can go directly to Jesus. You don't have to go through any other man. But you can confess that directly to your high priest. You can go right to your high priest and confess that sin. And as we read in verse 9, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now wait a minute, Brother Ben. You said that we are forgiven because of the work of Christ on the cross. And we were forgiven from that moment on, even before we were born. Our sins had been forgiven us legally. That's true. But we still live in this world as sons of God. We're born of God. We're under the chastening of God, the parental umbrella of God. When we sin, there is chastening. However, if we confess our sins, if we forsake our sins... He will forgive us our sins and He's not going to chasten us the way that He would have. If my children, let's say my children get into a fist fight in the driveway. Did that ever happen in your household? The reason I mention it. Let's say there's a brawl in the driveway and I yank them inside and they're obstinate and adamant. It's going to be a lot worse of a disciplinary action than if they're crying and saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we're sorry, forgive me. If there's confession, if there's confession, the chastening is not going to be as severe. But if they're telling me I'm crazy and wrong and they didn't do anything wrong, despite the fact that I saw both people slinging their fists one at another, 
No, there's going to be quite a bit of chastening for that. Annabelle figured out at a young age that if she grins and giggles and says, I'm sorry. Okay. She learned to wrap someone around her finger. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. There's not the level of chastening when we're apologetic, when we're sorry and we confess them. There's not the level of chastening that there would be if we are obstinate or if we ignore the sin. If we confess to Christ, he's faithful and he will forgive us our sins. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, do you literally make God a liar? No. What that language is saying is that you're calling God a liar. Your theology would make God out to be a liar if you say that you have no sin. Have you ever met a man that said, well, I got saved 25 years ago. I have not committed sin since. Liar. By the authority of the word of God, you're telling a lie. And last time I checked, telling a lie was a sin. What a beautiful promise in chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. When you do sin, guess what you have standing on the right hand of God, seated at the right hand of God? You have your high priest, your advocate with the Father who makes intercession for you. And when you do sin, God the Father as judge sees you through Christ as we have talked about the last two weeks. And we can go to him and we can beg his forgiveness and our life is not going to become what it could become if we were obstinate. He will even take away some of the negative repercussions of that sin. The quicker we confess it, the quicker we forsake it. It literally takes us out of the broad way that leads to destruction and puts us back on that straight and narrow that leads to life the preservation of life and life abundantly. Our public face is to be one of the confession of sin. You know what? When you find a child of God that is a disciple of Christ that loves the Lord and goes to church, and he confesses publicly that I am a sinner, you find other sinners are comfortable to come to him. They can talk to him. They can approach on him and say, You know, brother, you are approachable. I don't feel... I don't feel inferior around you. I can talk with you. I can relate to you. Why? Because you're really living out the true gospel. It's not the fake show. It's not the pomp. It's not the boast. It's real. It's actual, genuine Christianity. And we also confess our faults one to another. A lifestyle of confession. The virtue of confession. In the book of James, chapter 5, James talks about this. If there's any among you afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Now, what type of salvation are we talking about here? We're talking about salvation from his affliction. One of the keys to understanding the Bible is that the word saved does not always mean born again. How many times in Christendom today do people apply that one definition on the word save every time it occurs in Scripture or any other context? Save simply means delivered. In this context, the salvation is deliverance from the affliction. So if you're struggling with an illness... The ministers can come lay hands on you, they can pray over you, and we beseech God, we make intercession for you, and if God grants that prayer, if it's His will, that illness can be cured. I love to know how common it is in the medical community for people who perform surgeries and attempt to treat those that are ill, seek God's face in prayer. I've even known of people who've gone into surgery and prior to the surgery, the doctor will say, could we have a word of prayer before you go under? To me, that is so comforting to know that those who treat others medically realize that for this to be successful, the God of glory has to intervene. It warms my heart. Part of successful treatment of illness is prayer. We beg God to intercede on our behalf. Now, there are many of you in this room that I pray for that are going through things. Brother Kenneth, when you had your, your scan the other day, we prayed for you. 
I prayed for you that day that you were going in to have your, your scan. Brother Carl, we've prayed for you so much as you're being treated for your cancer. We have prayed for you. Everyone in here, if you have gone through a health crisis, I have personally and we have personally prayed for you. If it's as simple as pain in your foot from standing all day at work, trouble in your home, having a pacemaker put in, shoulder surgery, cancer, eye surgery, I've prayed for you. And that's a successful part of our treatment. But you notice he goes beyond that to spiritual sickness. James 5, 16, confess your faults one to another and pray for another that you may be healed. Confess your faults. Now, what type of church do you think someone struggling that comes in off the street looking for spiritual food what type of church do you think they would interpret Flint River to be if they came in feeling inferior because they, are, they know what they are if the grace of God has changed their heart and they walk in off the street and they see, I struggle with anger, y'all. Please help. Please pray. Oh, I've, I've had a terrible week. I've had to deal with this issue and that issue and this sin and that sin. And people begin to confess their faults one to another. And we begin to pray for one another instead of judging one another, to pray for one another. You know what type of a church they'll interpret this as being? One that they feel welcome in. I can tell you that much. But if they come in off the street and they see that we look down on others and they see that, that we, and, I, and you don't, because I know you and I know your heart, and I know that you're one of the most forgiving congregations. Now there's a time where the rubber meets the road that, that we stand up and we say, enough is enough, we're not going to tolerate that especially when it becomes destructive to this body. But I know, I know you, that you are long-suffering. But if they come in off the street and they see that we think we're better than people who have the struggles of this life, as if we don't, they're not going to feel at home here. I've read so many studies of the unchurched in America, and there are many of them who wish they could be a part of an assembly, but they just feel unworthy to be there. Let me tell you, if you're listening today, and if you hear this message wherever you hear it and you feel yourself unworthy, come on in because this is the place for you. Amen. Because we feel ourselves to be unworthy. We don't believe we're better than anybody else. Confess your faults. Don't put on a show of religion. We need to have the public face of the confession of sin. Pray for one another that you may be healed from what? Spiritual sickness. From sin that plagues you and affects you and damages you, that ruins your relationships wherever they may be. And then we find these most famous words, probably the most famous words in the book of James. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You realize that those words were spoken in the context of confessing not necessarily your physical afflictions, but your spiritual afflictions. James wrote those words with sin sickness in mind. Confess your faults. No, he doesn't say confess all of your sins. You know, Tuesday night at 11.05, I really messed things up. No, your faults, your sinful inclinations. I struggle with envy. Confess it. I struggle with anger. Confess it. Feel that burden lifted off your shoulder because you don't have to hide it, but you can confess it to your brothers and sisters. And rather than being judged for it, you'll find strength as we lift one another up the same way that we would lift you up in prayer if you were physically struggling with cancer or with heart failure or with any other issue. But we also need to put on the public face of the confession of sin publicly to those who are around us. One of the reasons I have this thought in mind today is because some of you know I had the opportunity to work with a group of high school children all week at a band camp. So one of the things that I do as a, a part-time trumpet player, trumpet teacher is work with children anytime that I'm given the opportunity because I love to work with children. I love to work with children. I love children. Very protective of children. I went to school to be a police officer, and one of the things I had in mind was the protection of children. I hate to see children abused. I have this 
burden in me for wicked people who do bad things to children to be put not just in a jail, but under a jail. I love to work with children. As we were eating lunch, day two, the instructors had learned that I was a pastor. It's amazing how things change when you realize you're in the presence of a minister. Because people think minister and they think, oh, no, man, i got to be really behave around this guy. And then they're around me 10 minutes and they realize, well, he's just a normal person like, like anybody else. But I was given the opportunity the second day that we had lunch, Pastor, would you return thanks over the meal? Yeah. Yeah, I'd be delighted to. And there in the middle of a restaurant, I had the opportunity to lead a bunch of other marching band instructors in a word of prayer. What was that? That was bearing witness. That was bearing witness. One of the things that I said in my prayer is, God, please forgive us for our sins. What is that? It's the public confession of one's sinfulness. My public face shouldn't be that I'm holier and righteous than anyone else. You should vote for me or elect me or put your support behind me because I'm better. My public face is to be the confession of sin. What do you think about Brother Ben? Well, he said he's a sinner. Amen. Matthew chapter 3, as men and women came to be baptized of John the Baptist, we read... They were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized of John, confessing their sins. Let me give you a great example of this from the book of 1 Timothy. A text that's been in my mind for a couple of weeks. I like it when a passage of scripture gets stuck in my mind as a song. You know, they call those earworms where you get a song in your head and you wake up at three in the morning and there it is. And you're like, I hate that I heard that song on the radio because I'm now I'm going to sit here for 30 minutes in my bed thinking this awful, ridiculous tune. I hate it. Do you hate it? Oh, I hate it. It's an earworm. It buries itself in your ear and you hear it all night. You hear it all day. It's stuck in your mind. Can't stand it. But this can be a positive thing. For example, I've had these words in my head, in my mind, 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, for two to three weeks. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Christ came to save sinners. He said it many times, I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, truth be known, everybody's a sinner. There is no one righteous in and of themselves. But there were religious people in Jesus' day that thought they were righteous because of what they had done. And Jesus said, you have no idea what I'm here to do. You've got no part nor lot in this matter. You don't feel the sting of sin on your conscience. You think you're doing all right and that you're more holy than other people. And you don't realize that you're actually worse off than the majority of these sinners that you're judging. Which one that went into the temple to pray went home justified, declared righteous in his conscience? The Pharisee that said, God, I thank you that I'm not as other men. Oh, I'm doing all right. I tithe. I give money to the church. I thank you that I'm not as others, especially that publican. And then that publican over there won't even lift up his eyes to heaven. He smites his breast. His only words are, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. That publican went home justified. He went home declared righteous because he didn't think he was better than anybody else. By the way, where had they gone? They'd gone to the temple. What should be our attitude when we come to the house of God? God have mercy on me, a sinner. I'm not better than anybody else. What is my public face? What is my religious face? What is my private face? Christ came to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now, I encourage you, homework assignment number two, Matthew 23 was homework assignment number one. Go home and read Acts chapter 7, 8, and 9. And read the story of the Apostle Paul as he was Saul of Tarsus, a man who was cruel, a man who was wicked and depraved, a man who literally rounded up Christians to execute them and torture them for their faith. 
And the Lord Jesus, in His grace and in His mercy, struck him down, changed his heart, quickened him when he was dead in sin, because He loved him despite his iniquity. That is the picture and pattern of grace. That is the pattern of those that believe. According to Paul himself in verse 16 of 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul says this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. It's, it's beyond dispute. It's worthy of universal exception. We all ought to accept it. That Jesus came into the world to save sinners and I am the chief of these sinners that Jesus came to save. In other words, Paul felt himself, and truth be told, in his day, it would be hard to find a sinner who did more harm and more sin to the cause than Saul of Tarsus. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ loved him and came into the world to save even him. Think about Paul. As he's rounding up Christians to execute them and compel them to blaspheme, as he would account later in the book of Acts. Every single one of those sins was paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross of Calvary. Jesus bled, Jesus suffered, Jesus died for the sins of this man that he had not yet even begun to commit because he loved him that much. That's a message of grace. That's a message of forgiveness. That's a message that will comfort the heart of a sin-sick sinner. And that is to be my face and your face in public. Not only should we proclaim that Jesus came to save us from our sins when we were yet His enemy, but we should proclaim the sufferings that we have in the flesh. Paul wrote about this in the book of Romans chapter 7. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. What Paul says in Romans 7 is that there are things he wants to do that are good that he doesn't do. There are things that are sinful that he doesn't want to do that he does. Because of the sin that dwells in him, verse 17. We have been legally saved from our sin, but we still practically have the nature of sin in us until either death or glorification. The nature of the flesh is there. I know... That in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing, he said in verse 18 of Romans 7. Today, I am to confess that I am a sinner. I don't have it all together. I don't have it all figured out. I'm not living the type of life that I could live, and neither are you. I can say with the Apostle Paul, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Romans 7:24. If that's your experience, you've got a home here at Flint River. Now let me give you five observations in the time that we have remaining. And these are very short. The benefit of this practice. What have we seen this week? Scandal. Someone religiously discredited. We should publicly confess our sin, number one, for the truth's sake, because it's simply a fact of the matter. It's right. It's always right to tell the truth. And the truth is we are sinners saved by God's grace, His unmerited favor. And even under this very present day, despite being regenerated by His grace and informed intellectually by His gospel, we still struggle with sin. And so we should proclaim it because it's just the fact. But this also fosters a realistic humility, not a feigned humility, not a fake humility. Not a boasted pomp or show. But this fosters a realistic humility. I, I, I'm a sinner. It's not cute. It's not funny. It's not okay. But I legitimately am a sinful man. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? This also prevents hypocrisy. You know one of the most condemned sins in the Word of God is hypocrisy. Again to Matthew 23, what Jesus said so many times to the scribes and Pharisees was, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! You say you're one thing, and in secret you're another. The public confession of sin prevents hypocrisy. Because it is the factual declaration of what we really are. I'm not going around telling people that I'm better than them. 
I'm going around telling people that I'm a sinner and if I have any merit, it's in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Right, number four, this closes the mouth of the scoffer. What took place this week when that very public figure who named Christ was found to be living in habitual sin. Did you pay attention to the media? What was one of the things that made it into nearly every headline? Ultra-religious coach found to be an adulterer. When we proclaim that we are sinners saved by grace who still struggles with sin up until this very present day, do you know what that does? It closes the mouth of the scoffer. I was telling Rachel this morning. You know, what would they say of Ben Winslet if Ben Winslet fell into sin? Well, you know, he really never claimed to be anything other than a sinner. One of the things that brought such shame when David sinned with Bathsheba, if you read that account in 2 Samuel, it gave the enemies of God reason to blaspheme. When they saw David's sin, it was so much bigger of an issue, and his sin was lust, adultery, conspiracy, bearing false witness, and murder. There's hardly any of the Ten Commandments that he did not violate in that one episode. But beyond the repercussions and the sin, it gave God's enemies reason to blaspheme. This man, David, this man of God, they claim to be so much. Look at the sin that he's committed. Publicly confessing our sin closes the mouth of the scoffer. Well, he never claimed to be anything other than a sinner anyway. Finally, number five. This mindset allows us to emulate the behavior of Jesus. Now, Jesus had no sin. Understand. Jesus had no sin. He was actually totally holy. But he ate with sinners. This public confession, this public faith that I am a sinner saved by grace, it excludes the pride that would make a boastful man withdraw in his self-righteous sanctimony. I'm not better than you. I'm not above you. I'm not separate from you. I'm a sinner just like you. And if you desire a home in a church full of people just like you, Flint River is the place for you to be. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for the grace that we have in Christ. We confess, dear Lord, that we are but sinful men. We thank you, Lord, for the salvation that Christ, your Son, has given us from our sins. But we thank you also, Lord, for the parental mercies you give us as we confess our sins, the, heal the healing that you give us when we confess our sins. Lord, we find healing. You give us strength to abstain from the sins. You bring us past the sins. You rise us above the sins. We pray, dear Father, that you forgive us of these. Let us be welcoming to those who struggle likewise. Let them know there's a home here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.